evening and welcome to this RCB Radio Sport West Clare special Munster Football Championship preview show live on 92.5 and 94.8 FM and online at www.rcb and on our YouTube channel streaming live on RCB Sport. I'm delighted to be joined this evening by an all-star cast of Munster Football Great. I'm delighted this evening to be joined by Paul Fitzgerald, a Tipperary uh, goalie who served 10 championship campaigns in the Tipperary jersey. I'm then delighted to be also joined by Limerick Perspectives this evening by the flying wingback sensation Pa Ranahan, who's been nine years in the Limerick uh, jersey representing nine championship campaigns. Then we move on, we have the, representing Cork, we have Daniel Goulding, uh, 10 years in the Cork jersey, two Munster titles, one All-Ireland and one All-Star. Then we have Owen Brosnan, 12 years soldiering in the Kerry jersey in the half hour line, seven Munster titles and three All-Irelands. Then we have Shane Briggs, who captained the Waterford numerous for numerous years, 15 years in the Waterford jersey, one of the prominent best man markers in Munster football. And then we have Francis McInerney, who captained Clare to their one and only Munster football uh, title victory back in 1992 over Kerry, who has won numerous uh, club championships with his respective uh, Dunbeg in, in, in County Clare and uh, was one of the one of the greats of uh, Clare football. So, lads, I, I'm just going to start. Uh, the, we had the hurling show last week, lads, and we spoke briefly about the club championship scenes, uh, what happened with COVID-19 in terms of the club championships being on before uh, inter-county and what it was like for the, the perspective within the county. And it seems to be great reaction towards it. I was speaking to Hurling and the general consensus that it so, should be something uh, looked at going forward in terms of a split season that the club players really, the inter-county players really enjoy being back with their club season, club players and getting to play the club championship. I suppose uh, I'm going to come to you first, Paul, in terms of Tipperary, uh, we had uh, a real good uh, Tipperary uh, senior football final between uh, Clonmel Commercials and the Glockmore uh, Castle, Lockmore Castellani. And what was the reaction below on the Tipperary in terms of the football championship? Has it been a success? What format did it take? And uh, obviously, in terms of the inter-county players being back with their clubs, do you think it was a real boost to the Tipperary uh, football championship this year? Yeah, it was. Obviously, it was. It was weird um, during lockdown. Everyone, everyone missed games and training and and, and and all that. But I think with guys at home more and obviously missing it a lot, uh, it, it it helped. It helped in the in the sense. I suppose lads got a perspective of what was important outside of football, but how much you miss it as well. And um, like the last few years in Tip. Uh, you've had the big three, Clamwell Commercials, Mile Rovers and Lockmore. And there's been one team kind of coming through to semi-final stage um, the last few years. It was Kilsheelan this year. Uh, strong strong Kilsheelan team um, pushed Commercials all the way in the semi-final. Um, so the standard from se- semi-finals on were good. Two, two good semi-finals and a very good final, um, which was positive. The only negative was... Uh, the format they took, they they done away with quarterfinals uh, because of the fixtures mm. quite rolling and rolling every week, and with Lockmore being a dual club as well, um, there was no quarterfinals in the football this year, which was disappointing. But um, you know, standard was high, uh, two good semi-finals and a good final. And in terms of the format, was a runoff in terms of a group stage? And do you think for the Tipperary uh, football manager, they uh, uncovered uh, one or two players uh, from the championship that might be uh, brought into the squad or players that are on the lower end of the Tipperary panel that uh, maybe uh, opened up a, a, a question mark to the management in terms of probably not featuring during the league, but obviously on the back of a real uh, good club championship uh, display could uh, obviously... Uh, Get, propel themselves onto the starting 15 against Clare? Possibly, yeah. They might have got a few, um, a look at a few guys. Um, the young Connor Ryan there from Lockmore had a good final now. Uh, he might be, he might be asking. The disappointing news today was John Mardo has, has uh, I think, left the football panel to go hurling. So he's a huge loss to us. Like, um, but he was the standout player this year in the hurling championship in tips. So it was inevitable he was going to get a call from from Sheedy, you know, so, um, but definitely you, 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 you got to, they got to look at guys that maybe mightn't have been involved in the earlier part of the year during the National League. Um, and, you know, that's all good for the thing as well to strengthen the panel, you know. 
And I suppose if I can move on to you now, Pa, in terms of the Limerick uh, f- uh, Football Championship this year, uh, what was the format adopted and in terms of the the championship itself? Was it a runoff? As it, was it a huge success having all the inter-county players and an interrupted season? Would you normally have a game in April and then no games in until August? Or what was the format like? And for the management perspective, do you think they've unearthed some players uh, from the club championship? Yeah, well, I suppose just the form was a bit different, the same as everywhere else. Uh, normally, it'd be two groups of six, and you'd have to get three and three out of each. But this year, just with the fixtures and all that, it went four groups of three. So I suppose the good the good thing was they made every game really very important. You couldn't afford to lose one because you mightn't get out of the group. Um, I suppose unlike Tipperary, we did get quarterfinals, which was great because this year in the semifinals, you'd you'd you the matchups that you wouldn't have gotten in other years just. The way it fell, you'd, you'd Newcastle West playing Adair in the quarterfinal. So it was going to be one of the big favourites gone out of that. Um, Adair in the final this weekend against Bell Landers, who beat us last week. Um, so it was run off brilliantly. Like, uh, I was injured this year, but I was just talking to the lads. Like, there's definitely a buzz around when you've got your county players. Like, anyone will tell you that when the county players are at the training sessions, everyone else just, I suppose, it's just natural. It, it lifts the levels around and that bit of interest around the place. And I suppose in, in Limerick we're lucky enough the same with Tipperary and Cork I think and like Sport and Limerick here were able to cover a lot of the games and I think they did clear matches as well so like even though people weren't able to make the games in live attendance there was a lot of people watching games maybe that I wouldn't have seen in previous years through streaming and online and Limerick JTV and all that sort of stuff um, as regards county managers and the selectors unearthing people um, I know I, I saw I met Billy at a few matches Billy Lee the Limerick manager like so he was definitely casting the net out to see was there anything that he had missed. Are his selectors the same? Had they missed during the year? I suppose the hard thing is you have very very short running time. Like the league is starting in two weeks, and you have basically game after game after game after that. Like so, while fellas might be coming in now, it's probably with a night twenty twenty one rather than this year's. I'd say. And uh, Pat, is there any players that were probably lower down in the picking order during the league stage that really had good championships and that probably shone maybe from an intermediate club or something like that that could have propelled themselves onto the to start the starting fifteen against Waterford New York mind? Yeah, well, just like it just it springs to mind now. I I was involved in Munger this year. We played Jared Griffiths last weekend, and Colin McSweeney, who would have started with say with Limerick in the championship last year, just picked up an injury then after the championship and missed a lot of the league that took place back in the early months, he was just, he was lifting like last week for, for the club. Like, so he'd be certainly a player that I would have said, you know, form wise is coming into it. So like you, you all the boys agree, like you get a serious kick off the club if you're going well. So any of the lads who are in county finals, county semifinals and, and linking back in with the inter-county setups, like if you're going well with your club, you're more than likely going to bring it, bring it into training and bring it. So he'd be certainly one. He would have started wing back last year in a lot of championship matches. Injuries, it probably COVID didn't suit everyone, but the likes of him it definitely suited because he was injured at the start of the year. Mm-hmm. And even the likes of Dara Tracy, who would have been away in Australia at the start of the year and was missing was going to miss the championship, like he's back as well now. So there's definitely pluses, like there's plenty of minuses to it, obviously. Mm-hmm. There's some pluses to it. And I suppose uh Owen, in terms of the Kerry Championship, I suppose look, you had a league championship and then you had a the, the the club championship as well, where all we had uh, like the East Kerry and uh, the West Kerrys, and I suppose an awful lot of football was played in uh, Kerry once the go ahead was uh, given, and I suppose East Kerry emerged trumps. But I imagine there was an awful lot of fixture congestion as well, trying to get so many games. I know there was a a fair catalogue of games played in Kerry, and I suppose. For uh, uh, for thinking, looking ahead at the championship, do you think players have shone through and uh, propelled themselves up the the order? Yeah, I suppose what we had is we the uh, obviously we did club championships, which was when 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 the club players came back playing or when 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 the game started up again, there was um all everyone had three uh, group games and there was a club championship, so there was a senior, an intermediate, and a junior. Um, the senior obviously it was just top two from each group went into a final, um, the intermediate and the junior. There was top two, so there was quarterfinals and semifinals. They played their group games and some of the quarterfinals and semifinals haven't yet even been played. So I think they're going to try and run them off this weekend and the following weekend. Um, I know the likes of the, the, the Kerry senior management won't be overly happy with that because we'll just say some of their best players, David Clifford, who was obviously with East Kerry, um, played in the county final last Sunday. 
he's playing this Saturday, I think, in a junior semi final with a potential for a junior final the following week and then out in the National League the following the following week. So it's a fairly hectic schedule and I'm sure he'll be keeping an eye on them for his trying to trying to keep them injury free as best he can. And then obviously we had the county championship, um, which was straight knockout. It made every game very, very interesting. So sixteen teams um run over about five or six weeks. So it was game, 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 and then there was a two week break to a final. Um very exciting football, uh, good competitive football. Um Kerry J streamed a lot of them. There was a few then obviously on TG four and stuff, but it was um obviously straight knockout. It was the old traditional, I suppose, format which the, the Sam Maguire and the Munster Championship is reverting to this year. So it um certainly I suppose something that it was a throwback to the old days where Every game was you had to show up, and if you didn't show up, you were you were finding yourself out of the championship early enough. And I suppose we um, all know the 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 pipeline in to get in terms of Kerry football and in terms of youngsters coming through. I suppose the championship obviously gave a chance for them to shine and probably put their hands up in, in relation for inclusion. Probably I'm thinking the likes of Paul O'Shea there from Kilcommon, a, a real cracking footballer. Uh, the likes of players of that quality that would have uh, carry minor All Ireland winners who maybe a year or two gone from that sort of stage now they'd be eligible and there's sort of the real pipeline so there's probably players that really had good carry championships maybe with their clubs into media that might have propelled themselves into the thoughts of their carry management likewise there might have been the likes of Darren Minahan who would probably had got some game time in the league and probably he had a really good championship so some of those guys could have really propelled themselves uh, up into the thoughts in terms of the starting 15 against Cork Yeah most definitely I, I'm sure the likes of Peter Keane and his management they had some kind of an idea of, of a team but it's very hard to know when they haven't been training together and whatnot and their 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 training I suppose Tuesdays and Thursdays or Tuesdays and Fridays and then a lot of players are going in with their club and stuff. So they're they're doing a bit that we haven't seen. So we don't know what what, what what's happening behind the closed doors. Certainly I know from the, the championship there's been three or four players brought in. I know there's um young O'Connor, the midfielder from Austin Stacks, a good prospect. And then you had from Mid Kerry, Mid Kerry, good championship pack. And Kenny is really was one of the shining lights in their defence. Um He's been brought. He, he was in earlier in the year, but I suppose he, it's Kerry. We'd be looking at backs, really, and can we find a few backs? Um, Beaufort's Mike Breen. He, they beat us obviously in the semi final. I know after that he got a call that he was brought in. So like they were certainly watching matches. Other players who the form wasn't as good got let go. Um, so as a, the, the the county championship this year was the shop window. It was the we'll call it the internal trial games, which would normally be happening inside the intercounty setups didn't take place. So the, the 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 county championship took on an added importance. And as I said, we're only two or three weeks away from national league, probably three or four weeks away from from um, championship, which knock is which is knockout football. So there hasn't been a whole pile of, of there is no, no county has had to has had the time really to put in a whole pile of work. Even it was in Cork where. We're still a week or two away from a county final, and I know the likes of Ronan McCarthy. If you were if you were an inter county manager, you wouldn't be impressed. Likewise, Peter Keane, where there's intermediate and junior championships here to be finished as well. So it, it it's going certainly going to be a different um, a different championship cup this this month's championship. I suppose, uh, Daniel, in terms of Cork, uh, I suppose an awful lot of clubs in Cork, probably one of the counties with the most, one outside of Dublin, probably one of the most, most clubs in, in the country, an awful lot of footballing clubs spread all over Cork as well. In terms of running off that sort of championship, did it go off? What was the format taken? And was there any sort of hitches or was there a real benefit as well to the club players having so many of the inter-county players back with their clubs? Because normally I presume in Cork that three quarters of the year as well that the club players and uh, the inter-county players aren't available to clubs so clubs in Cork I suppose are used to going without their county players for a long long time well, I suppose this was the first year that they actually rebalanced the whole grading system so traditionally you would have a uh, knockout championship with a back door and you could have 24 or 5 teams in the senior so it led, it led to a lot of kind of Poor teams getting good beatings and being out of championship early, whereas this year they regraded everything. So it was 12, 12 teams per grade and uh, three groups of four then. So much more competitive championship seen throughout um, the grades from senior, senior A, intermediate. There was two intermediate grades, uh, two junior grades. Um, and I suppose the one, the one issue, again, is the amount of games that has to get played in Cork, even with this refined system, which was brilliant. Loads of games for everyone. We still haven't got it finished. And you have dual clubs reaching semi-finals of both kind of hurling and football, and that, that delays games then. And it'll probably lead to some county finals being played after the inter-county 
um, season is over, which isn't ideal. Um, but in terms of for playing with club players, playing with their inter-county lads, it's, it's fantastic. And I think the games are really competitive this year and the ability for people to watch different club games through club streaming was, was fantastic. Um, in terms of unearthing fellas, I think the big thing for Cork is that there are players that they've in there at the moment. They were <coughs> maybe 30, 40 players through the league. The majority of those lads are playing well. And I suppose that's that's the real benefit at the moment. You've Luke Connolly there, and I was playing really well for Nemo. Uh, Brian Hurley's playing well for Castlehaven. Um, one lad I'd like to see come in is Dan O'Donnell from Kilimatra. Um, he was with the Cork 20s. He was, um, he's a really good player. Hasn't been in the Cork setup yet, but I think there's definitely something in him. He's a dangerous forward, really fast, and, and can kick with both feet. He's, he's playing really well for Kilimatra. I'd love to see him in there. Yeah, and I suppose, uh, Daniel, lastly, before I move on, uh, in terms of the, the league, I suppose Cork had so much momentum. Uh, they were flying uh, undefeated, I suppose, as well. Is it going to be hard for them to pick up where they sort of left off in terms of that momentum? Uh, obviously, they would have loved to have that sort of league success uh, going in, uh, in ticket playing the likes of Kerry, I suppose, uh, Feeling in two weeks, I suppose all that momentum has started broken up. Do you think the club scene has started to manage to keep that going in terms of the momentum? Um, I suppose it's hard to kind of have that momentum when they come back in. Um, just unfortunate, I suppose, as it happened. Um, Cork had, were building a very strong young squad, and I suppose trying to keep them together during lockdown was virtually impossible. So uh, it's definitely going to be a challenge, but. Look, as I said, at least the club championship was very competitive this year and the majority of the Cork lads in the setup are playing well in the club championship, which is a benefit. But I suppose this is going to be seen throughout the championship. I think the teams that have been around the block and have a bit of experience definitely have an advantage. And I suppose, uh, Shane, if I can bring you on now to the Waterford Championships, how was that sort of run out in Waterford this year? What was the format taken? Yeah, yeah, we had um, four groups of three with the top two going into the quarterfinals. Uh, obviously, after the hurling was finished. So it was, um, generally speaking, very well received. Unfortunately, in Waterford, I think two or three of the teams are far superior to the rest. So you had, like, say, my own club handing out hidings, Rack Ormac handing out hidings. But then the other two teams in the group would be quite competitive. But the problem with that then is when you get to the quarterfinals, those top seeded teams again were handing out hiding, hidings to the lower seeded quarterfinalists. So, like when we get to the, we're only in, we've one semi final played and the other one coming this weekend, they've been a bit more competitive or they will be more competitive. But I think the tr- top two teams, the Nair, Rakar, McBanley, Corti, are, are just that bit ahead of everybody else. And in terms of Shane, in terms of the Waterford uh, management, uh, in terms of going out, in terms of looking mm-hmm. at the club championship, I know Waterford is a strong uh, hurling uh, traditionalist county. Obviously, there are probably players who are probably really talented dual players who haven't for some reason made the Waterford hurling setup that might be available to the footballers or young uh, sort of footballers who were on the maybe Waterford 20s last year that had really good uh, championship campaigns that might have been propelled themselves up to thoughts in terms of the senior record recognition is do you think the waterford management have added to their, to their squad it's it's very hard to know because a lot of the championships are still going on right now so like the, none of them have been finished in terms of football yet like the big thing with waterford is there are some very good young players and i know at the start of the year there's a huge transformation in the squad and a lot of young players in but like it comes down to appetite there are some very good young players but do they want to play um, that's that's a huge key issue for Waterford. The turnover in the squad over the last few years has been huge. So, I mean, look, um, it, it might help that the fact that there's a condensed inter-county season that when Benji Whelan goes back to those players, probably they have been back already in the last couple of weeks, but it hasn't really leaked out or some of those players haven't been training so far with the county that they might give it a good lash for the two or three weeks. But um, like they haven't... In previous years, a lot of them happened because of the long drawn out into the county season, and I suppose the perceived lack of success that the, the county team would have. I suppose, uh, Francis, if I can bring you on now to the Clare uh, Championship season, uh, a new format in Clare as well. I suppose the games uh, came ticking fast and everything was. Uh, 
pretty much knockout from the world to go, but the two traditional sort of powerhouses from Clare football in the last few years, uh, Kilmaria, Bricken and Cracklow, they met in the showpiece. Uh, but an awful lot of youngsters from the previous minor squads in the last three years uh, where Clare got to the All-Ireland quarterfinals uh, in two years on the trot and then the uh, Munster minor su- success last year. They really shone and there was a good, lot, good crop of young players coming through in Clare. That's true. Um, Clare had a different format this year where they had um, two groups, you know, 16 teams and eight, eight play eight and uh, the winners then played each other again. So, uh, and then there was a losers group. So it was quite difficult to come through the losers group. And I think the, the first round there of uh, Kilmurray, Bricken and Milltown made it quite difficult for Milltown to uh, progress. And ultimately Kilmurray went on to win it. But uh, it was very competitive. And I suppose, unlike a lot of other counties, we suffered from, uh, a lot, we needed more games. And uh, I think the it would have teams would have got more into the championship, and you know other teams, even other counties, were slow in uh, you know agreeing to challenge games. So uh, teams were kind of going very much cold into it, and if you build up momentum at all, you you you're a good start made. But I suppose with Colin Collins being manager of Cracklow, he got a close look at all the teams and the formations and uh, the players who were showing up. And at the start of the year, Clare Twenties had a good campaign. The, had a great battle with Cork 20s and uh, a lot of those players shone in the championship. Yeah, and I suppose in, in terms of Clare, I suppose uh, the two semi-finals as well were really a uh, good uh, contest. Uh, Lissy Casey and St. Brickens, uh, two young sides uh, coming through St. Brickens off their intermediate championship uh, against the Munster uh, final that, last year against Tipple No, They really took uh, took to the depths of the Clare Championship, got all the way to county semi-final and uh, were on the crest of a wave and an awful lot of good young players in that same brick side as well that played against Tipple No last year. That's true. Uh, a lot of the teams, you know, the, the rural teams, as we say, um, they did benefit of the COVID. A lot more people around, you know, unfortunately people didn't have jobs to go to or the students didn't have jobs so they were available for the local football team but I suppose maybe in Clare would have been a strong dual county. It's hard to run off and, you know, with the population being over near Innes and the east of the county, you know, Cracklow, Kilmurray, you know, um, Eroge have to be cared for it as well. So, uh, as I said, a lot of young players, uh, you know, gave a good effort this year and it was a competitive championship. Okay, so guys, we're going to move on now. We're going to talk about the games and we're going to start off. The first game takes place on Saturday, October the 31st. It's Limerick versus Waterford in Fraher Field, uh, Dungarvan. I suppose uh, with uh, Tipperary sort of waiting and Tipperary and Clare waiting in the wings, wings I'm going to come to Tipperary, man, first of all. Uh, Paul, uh, in terms of uh, Limerick and Waterford, I suppose they are, uh, every time Limerick and Waterford meet, uh, it's always a competitive game. Anytime Limerick and Waterford meet, uh, Clare or Tipperary as well, it's a competitive game. And what do you expect uh, in terms of this encounter? Limerick uh, on a good season so far in the Division 4 league. Uh, they won the McGrath Cup at the start of the year, a bit of silverware, while Waterford has always been able to go toe-to-toe with Limerick. Yeah, I suppose Limerick are one of the teams this year that, you know, the last thing, a bit like Cork in, um, as well in the league, where the, the last thing they needed was was this thing to hit, like, because they were going absolutely w- really well, like Billy Lee then as well is doing a great job. And if if anyone deserved promotion, it would be him because, uh, you know, he has put massive, massive work into Limerick football. Um, you know, we were we went in last year's championship against Limerick um, favourites like in Turles and... Uh, we we'd, we'd a few injuries during the year and lads came back late and maybe weren't match sharp but no excuses we we like you you take Limerick for granted like and they'll absolutely you know they'll 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 take you like because they over the years even going back to past time before that like even against Cork and Kerry they they wouldn't be under any illusions like they 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 have a real really confidence in themselves and um, when they hit farm and if you're not on farm they'll take you like. Um, Watford, like uh, Shea said, like it's 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 to get players um playing for Watford is the thing now. I I'm doing a bit of goalkeeping coaching with the Nair now, uh, the last few weeks and uh, we're out Saturday night. But you know I, I see even the likes of Jamie Barron, Tom Barron there with the in with the Watford hurlers. They're as good as footballers as you see. Like and um and there's a lot of guys at that in Watford. It's it's to get them to play. Like the the talent is there. Like um. But between, you know, Limerick, Waterford, Tip, um, Clare, you, you know, there's, there's nothing really in it on any given day. And, um, you know, there'll be competitive games and 
a bit of momentum could could mean a lot this year. Like, uh, in terms of Limerick and Waterford, I suppose always when they do meet, the key battle is all always around the middle third, that primary possession in terms of the midfield battle. And I suppose we've heard there that Dara Tracy is probably back in the ranks for Limerick, and obviously that's going to be a huge addition around the middle third. Uh, Dara accomplished uh, midfielder. I suppose uh, whoever gets a platform on the in the midfield battle, I suppose the way both teams set up in terms of getting the ball into their inside forward line. I suppose I suppose that's going to be crucial and I suppose is that where the game's going to be won and lost you think in a tight tussle between Limerick and Waterford? Yeah of course uh, you, you see how important kickouts and kickout strategies are now in, in football and um, all based around that middle third who can win breaks, who can get primary position and who can who can turn it into scores you know so it'll be no different in that game um, the It'll be interesting to see that the advantage of going long now in, in games is is more uh, bigger than than ever before, probably. Where um, you know, short kickouts uh, with, with the mark now, you know, it's it's probably more advantage. If you can win primary position or break and ball by going long, the advantages are there because teams can't get back fast enough, maybe to to defend uh, as opposed to going short where you have to work at the whole way up the field or play a running game. So. Yeah, like you said, that that battle in the middle of the third will decide it. Like, yeah, I suppose uh, Pa, and uh, for a Limerick point of view, you would have come across uh, Waterford many a times. Uh, you would have came, up, came across uh, Shane in battle as well. And I suppose Limerick Waterford they meet an awful lot in the league as well, so they're very much uh, accustomed to each other. And I suppose. In terms of Limerick Waterford, it's a home advantage is a big thing always, and I suppose that advantage Waterford have been at home in Dungarvan. They know that field inside out. It's a difficult place to go to get a Munster Championship victory. Many teams have gone down to Dungarvan in qualifier action as well, and uh, big so counties in Division Two and have come, uh, come away with their tails between their legs. So you're really going down to a fortress to take on uh, Waterford. So that home advantage is going to be worth or four points to Waterford. Ah, oh, yeah, it is like like you said. We when we were playing, like we was playing like ourselves in Waterford. We play, like in Shane, like every it felt like every week there at one stage we were playing Waterford. And I think it's kind of like the lads nowadays because with the McGrath Cup and with the league, you're meeting them. It'll be the it'll be the third time this year they've met. And Limerick have two wins, and like any anyone will tell you, it's very hard to beat a team twice in the year, not to mind three times in the year. So, but yeah, look. Don Garvin and Farfield, like in the height of the summer, it's 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 a hard place to play, and not to mind in a Saturday night in winter, in winter. So like, and with the with the wind howling in there, so it's definitely it's it's a tough place to go. It you learn it. I think Cork were very lucky to come out with a win there not so long ago in Munster Championship. So home advantage is a big thing, especially in a tight little venue like that. It's different if you're playing in a big open place, which is very little very little advantage there. But yeah, look. I suppose no more than Tipperary and Clare. When you're on the opposite side of the draw to the big two, like there's definitely um, that kind of hope. Anyway, that's that for all the counties that there's a monster final to get to. Whatever happens after that happens, but there's no point thinking too far down the road. If you lose your first match, as Owen said earlier, it is one and one and done. If you lose, so it'll be um, it'll be a big one, and it's coming straight off the back of the league. So. I suppose it's important for Limerick and Waterford that they hit the ground running the league and, and within, within a week or two then they're playing blood air. But yeah, it'll be tough. Like I said, beating a team three times in the one year, it's not an easy thing to do. And you mentioned the league there as well, Pat. How important is it for Limerick to finish strong in terms of the league, those two games, to build up that sort of momentum again? I suppose in terms of to try and get that consistency going in. Obviously, going into Waterford is going to be a di different than any sort of league game. And Waterford under Benji Whelan, they're a very uh, tactical, astute outfit. They come with a game plan and one-off games. Uh, I remember them playing uh, Clare last year above in Cusick Park and they came for a game plan there for 60 minutes and Clare just could not break it down and were very sort of fortunate uh, to get over the line. So in terms of that, I suppose as well, carrying a bit of momentum for Limerick uh, going into the game. But we do know Waterford have an awful lot of uh, strengths as well and uh, really some good scoring forwards, uh, fit, agile, sort of uh, a running sort of team that sort of play a good transition type game of football as well. So if you don't really take your chances below on far field, no better team to punish you than Waterford. Yeah, and I suppose... And I suppose Limerick still have a chance of promotion league, which is good in the sense if they get it, they'll be coming off with a serious high 
of getting out of the league, which is a massive thing for teams down in Division 4 and 3. Waterford, I suppose they'll be gearing for the Limerick match. So they'll be tapering, they'll be looking at the fellas, they'll be trying things out in the two last two league matches. So like they'll have that on the horizon, whereas Limerick will have the two games. So like like you said, a lot will depend how the two league games go for Limerick. Because if they don't get, like they're in a good position at the minute, but that division is so tight that they probably need to beat Wexford and beat Sligo just to get out of the, which and get six wins out of seven, which was, which is is nearly always the case down there. Five wins doesn't really cut it anymore. So if they don't get it, you're kind of wondering, okay, is, is there going to be a bit of a hangover the week after them going into a championship match down there? Whereas if they do get the, the that promotion, you get a bounce off of that then and you're heading in with confidence. And Billy Lee, I'm sure Billy, if you asked him now, would you rather a month's attempt to win or get out of Division 4? Like, I'd say Division 4, getting out of that is, is a massive thing for the group. And I suppose if I can move on now to a neutral perspective, uh, a Kerry perspective on, and I suppose Limerick and Waterford, uh, if all goes to plan for one of them, uh, the most uh, Kerry can meet them is only in a Munster final. But uh, you can provide a neutral perspective on this. Uh, Limerick and Waterford, both teams down in Division 4. I suppose if you were going on the earlier on in the year, based on form, you would probably say uh, Limerick. But with everything happening with COVID and all that, and form gone out the window and the sort of condensed sort of championship. What are your thoughts on this game? Yeah, it's a, it's a hard one to call. Um, going down to Farrer Field, as, as, as fellas have said earlier, there is always a hard place to go. Certainly even if the summertime we had to play down there, but I played a few club games, we'll say later in the year, and a uh, tough place to go. Waterford will obviously know it inside out. Um, Limerick, obviously with a form team earlier in the year, but I think the form has gone out the window for every team, whether it's from from Dublin down to London. Well, obviously London aren't taking part, but we'll say the bottom team in Division 4, no team has form. Um, the two league games are going to be very interesting for, for all teams because they're being used as warm-up games, really. Um, and uh, as I said, if Limerick can win the two of them, they'll go down there, I suppose, confident, really, but it's, it's a very hard one to call. And I suppose I'll go to another neutral perspective. And I suppose, Daniel, you're on the same boat as Owen. Uh, you won't meet either Limerick or, or Waterford uh, in terms of Cork unless they're, unless they're successful and come through the other side to a uh, Munster final. You've had the experience of Fraherfield. You've also had the experience with tough battles with uh, Limerick down to your ears. What are your thoughts on this game? Um, I suppose we went down to the Fraherfield two years ago and or might have been three and got over there with a point in the last minute to get us over to Fairfield. So I think the big, th- the big thing for both Limerick and Waterford is the preparation and what they've actually done in lockdown on their own. And like, there's going to be, there's going to be um, huge value put on individual work that's been done and how fit teams are and, you know, how good their club championship has been. Um, I think with these kind of games, they're so tight, it's, it's whoever's going to prepare better and whoever uses the ball kind of more intelligently and sticks to their game plan on the day and knows what they're about. And I suppose if you look at if you look at Limerick's form um, in the league, they probably are better prepared going on that from, from Waterford. And the, I know the Waterford Championship was put on a bit later because of the hurling taking precedent. And I'd probably imagine Limerick would probably get out of there, but it'll be a very tight squeeze if I was looking at it from a total neutral perspective. And I suppose uh, we'll go to the Waterford viewpoint. I suppose, uh, Shane, uh, it opens up an opportunity this year for Waterford in terms of the draw. I suppose if they looked at the Munster Championship, if they asked themselves what sort of draw they would have wanted, this would have been it to play Limerick in the first round of fellow Division 4 team, then having a crack at a Division 2 team or Division 3 team in in terms of Clare or Tip. And then obviously if you're successful in, in, in that, then you play one of the traditional powerhouses in Munster football. So obviously for Mar- Waterford, it's probably the draw they want. And I suppose in terms of, you mentioned the championship not being finished, that's a bit of a hindrance. But look, home game against Limerick at the start of the year, a chance to play in a Munster semi-final against Clare and Tip. I suppose most Waterford footballing supporters and fans would say, oh, this is really, this first time this is a championship in Waterford that we can really look forward to with great hope anyway. Yeah, well, I suppose when the draw is made first, clearly if you're a Waterford footballer, the, like considering that the fact that they've never played in a Munster final, I suppose, <laughs> in a very, very long time, you look at the draw and you say that's fantastic. But then you see, like, you have to go and beat Limerick. And, like, we haven't won that many championship games in the last, in most championship games, in the last, you know, 30, 40 years. 
in terms, I agree with Daniel there, and I'm worried about Waterford because actually we don't have two National League games. We got one because the, the game to London is off. So preparation is already, um, you're struggling. And the, new, the National League game you do have, you got to go up to Antrim, which is a place like, you know, you got <laughs> more than likely you're probably getting on a bus, probably going for three or four hours. Club championships aren't finished. I, I, I would doubt that the structures are in place as well in the county that a lot of guys would have a huge amount of work done for football specific training over the last six months. So all of those things pointing together, I would be slightly worried along with Limerick's form through the National League and the competitive nature of our championships versus theirs. So, I mean, I think that Farfield will be a great leveller and even though Waterford have always been incredibly competitive against Limerick and they've won a lot of games in the National League, we've always fallen short in the championship. And I think, you know, getting over the line is going to be incredibly hard. I suppose uh, in terms of uh, Benji Whelan, uh, we know his success in terms of the Nair and what Nair have done in Munster Championship uh, football as well. He's an astute manager. Uh, last year, he came with a game plan against Clare, against C Cusick Park, a Clare team that were riding high. And uh, we saw Clare out uh, the championship day, narrowly missed out on the Super 8s and Waterford ran him, to, ran him to, to so close. So obviously, Benji is going to have a tactic and a game plan uh, for, for Limerick as well as He's probably not going to show his hand in the last two game, the last game either against Antrim. So obviously uh, for Limerick as well, uh, it's going to be how they acclimatise at a tactical battle, I imagine. Yeah, I, I mean, look, Benji's very astute. He's been involved with numerous teams in Waterford and look, they're going to have to be astute because they don't have huge men. And Paul mentioned there, you know, about the battle in the middle of the field. Like Tommy Prendergast is now, he's he's retired. The goalkeeper, Stephen Enright, is gone. So you have a brand new goalkeeper as well. Um, like Michael Curry's a fantastic footballer for Rack Gormack, but he's, he's not a huge man. So Waterford will actually, they can't afford to kick the ball out to the middle of the field because they don't have the large bodies out there. So they're going to have to play a running game. And again, the time of the year, we're looking at the end of October, where you can get swallowed up very easy by big men, gang tackled and, you know, they're going to have to move the ball quickly. They have some phen phenomenal footballers, Connor Murray, uh, but again, light, quick, fast. And it's going to be very interesting how they can adapt to the conditions this time of the year. Hmm. I suppose, uh, lastly, I suppose the other neutral perspective of watching eyes on the player will be watching with Tipperary. They will play uh, either the winners of uh, Limerick or Waterford in a semi final. We are very customised to what Limerick and Clare battles and Clare versus Waterford battles. We never had anything easy against Limerick or Waterford, uh, Francis. They two play each other. What are your thoughts on this game? Well, I suppose it's a great opportunity to uh, progress and both sides will be looking, thinking they'll have a chance. But Limerick seem very focused this year, just looking from the outside. They seem to uh, have you know played very well all through the league and they have momentum going. But you know, that can go as well now with COVID and the lack of uh, game time. But I think Limerick um, by <coughs> seem to be uh, um, well, you know, focused and well uh, organised. And uh, I think Limerick probably win down there. But as you say, it's uh, winter football, so it will be a tight affair. Yeah, and I suppose uh, Francis, uh, looking on from it, I suppose as well, uh, Claire will have in interesting eyes as well. Uh, probably the, the likelihood is that... Um, if Limerick and Waterford, if it's Limerick, we'll, we'll be travelling, uh, if Clare, if Clare or Tipperary or Victorious, they could be travelling uh, to uh, Limerick, or uh, if, if Waterford or Victorious, uh, then they're looking at a home, sort of, home, probably a home semi-final as well. So, obviously, in terms of uh, Limerick and Waterford, uh, Clare know them right well, and Tipperary know them right well as well. So, Obviously, to, obviously, how those teams finish in the league is probably going to have a big bearing as well because they do have to jump up uh, another division or, or so as well when they're playing uh, Tip or Clare or whoever they meet. Maybe that's true, but uh, I suppose Clare will be focused on their very vital uh, last two league games, yeah, for men and Armas. So uh, Clare will be, you know, if they have a good run in that, they, they won't fear anyone. But, you know, the, the other counties there, Clare traditionally down through the years have, have found it very hard going against the, you know, Waterford, Tipperary, Limerick. So uh, I'm sure they don't fear Clare any great way either. So um, Clare left to focus on their league games. Very important. Uh and I suppose we'll move on to the next contest now, Sunday, November the 1st, uh, the other quarterfinal, Clare versus T uh, Tipperary in Simple Stadium. We'll go back to you, Paul. I suppose uh, Tipperary, a few new additions back into the Tipperary fold. I see Michael Quinlevin is uh, 
back in the setup and uh, one or two more players that weren't uh, available in terms of the league action uh, have come back into the Tipperary fold. So Tipperary have strengthened their hand in terms of what they have available in, uh, in terms of what they had in the league. Uh, it's a much stronger squad that they have available <coughs> to come championship this time around. Yeah, definitely. When the draw was made earlier in the year, I suppose the texts were flying, geez, this is a great draw, but unfortunately, the same texts would have been flying in clear that they were happy with the draw too. And the interesting thing, as you said, at that time, um, we were definitely down three or four uh, established players, you know. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I know Gary Brennan and Keenan Sexton might be missing for Clare too. I'm not sure what the situation is now. But like you said, we've we've Mikey Quinn living back, Paddy Fien back, Liam Casey is available. Uh, Lee McGrath is still unavailable. He didn't. He was off travelling as well and they didn't come home. Um, so, so, you know, obviously, I think we're in a better position now, personnel-wise, than we would have been um, had it been on in the summer. But uh, it probably counts for nothing now anyway because uh, everyone is starting again almost. And um, we're down John Mayer now, it seems, as well. Like I said earlier, he's gone hurling. So, um, you know, the, la- the last few years, uh, Tip and Clare's paths were fairly similar, but going to Division 2, um, we've slipped a bit now. Um, and uh, two vital National League games left against um, Offaly and Leitrim, with the, the last one against Leitrim probably deciding our, our fate, will we get relegated or not? So, and Clare, you know, if they stay up again, like Collins has done a phenomenal job down there, like uh, to be that consistent over the last few years and, and playing... National League at that high level, like, is is brilliant for them. Like, so again, look, it's in Torless, probably a bit of a, uh, it can be an advantage too, as a times and a disadvantage, because because most teams that come to Torless love playing there as well. Like, so, um, and our home form hasn't been great. Like, so, you know, it'll be an interesting one. Uh, more so the fact that we probably have more players back now, as I said, than we would have had if it, w- it was earlier in the year. And I suppose that it's a long time since Clare and Tipperary have met. Uh, in Munster football championships, I know they've met in the league once or twice, but in terms of championships, their path have never really crossed uh, in the last sort of few years, and there's always been a point in for it. They do now meet, and I suppose one thing about this sort of a game, uh, it has the, it definitely an awful lot of quality on paper for both sides in terms of a, a spectacle as well. Uh, Clare and Tipperary they had a thriller last year uh, below in the league, below in sort of Torles as well, and. Well, both will be seeing this if if they can come off this uh, victory. Whoever gets the victory here, if Tipperary can get the victory over Clare, they'll carry savage uh, momentum and they'll be looking at uh, carrying that the whole way probably to a monster final. So whoever gets over this will probably be uh, have a bounce in their step. You imagine? Yeah, like and uh, and obviously the 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 advantage of getting to a monster final is huge this year. Like so, with the new format and everything. So look, it's. It's hard to say. It's 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 easy to say. It's a fifty fifty game. A lot will depend on how um, how players come out of the club championships, how players uh, come out of the last two games of the league, which are hugely important for both teams. And um, and then it's just about having a crack off off it in championship. And whoever whoever comes out on top will be, as you said, will be going into that semi final with a bounce. I suppose uh, uh, Limerick uh, path. If you emerge victorious over Waterford, you're you're going to either face uh, Clare and Tipperary. And I suppose you have a good track record in terms of you were underdogs last year against uh, Tipperary and were deserving sort of winners. I suppose you carry that bit of momentum uh, in, in the league campaign. If you carry that momentum in, in, into championship with a victory below in Friar Park, uh, I suppose Clare and Tipperary will... Uh, Showing off, showing off fear to Limerick, but uh, in terms of the game itself, Clare and, and Tipperary, it's an intriguing battle. Yeah, it is. Look, if you were looking at one of the, uh, as one of the farm teams in the country the last few years, it's been Clare. Like they've been outstanding in what they've done, getting so close to getting to Super Eights and getting to the quarter final after beating Roscommon a few years ago. Like they've been on a an upward curve with Colin Collins for years. Like and like Paul already said at the start of the year, you were going in without Gary Brennan and, and Jamie Malone. I don't know what the story was Gary. He got hurt in a club match with his back. I don't know, but you probably, you probably know better. But And Jamie Malone, I know he said during the summer he didn't know, but like they're two massive players. They get on any county team in Ireland, I'd say. So like to have them back, and then you look at Tipperary, as Paul said, with Mike Quinlevin back and, and Liam Casey. Like, it's a different match altogether now 
than it would have been in, in the summer without this happening. So it, it, it'll be interesting to see who gets the boost, who gets the bigger boost off it. But it's good for Tip, it's on internalist because Coosey Park is just a t- such a tough place to go and win. Like So it's definitely an advantage having it there. They'd also have that bit of kind of bite after losing the relegation game last year in Division 2 to clear in that classic game. Like So and I'd say Clare are just happy not to be in Kerry for, in, for a while in, in Munster because it's, it's been killing them not getting the Munster final because they keep running into Kerry in semi-finals and quarter-finals. Like, so I know you're saying Limerick and Waterford, but if you're Clare and Tipperary camp, you're probably thinking, if we can win this match, like, it is definitely there for us on farm to, to get to Munster final because Limerick have met Clare a good few times now in the last few years and it's, it's been a close on occasions, but they definitely have the, their number. I suppose, uh, Pat, if you look at this game, I suppose Connor Sweeney has caused so many problems to Clare down through the years, a real sort of one of the best forwards in the country. But flip it on the side, then you have David Tuberty as well for Clare, who's caused so many problems for Tipperary. I suppose that's an intriguing battle in itself, who picks up those sort of two players, that sort of matchup. I suppose that's going to have the big, big bearing. I suppose Connor Sweeney can do rack against Kerry and Cork, and David Tuberty can do rack against. Kerry and Cork as well. Uh, so those two players on both sides, I suppose, will have a they'll be man marked. I say, I imagine. Yeah, I'm. I, I I might be doing him a disservice, but I I like it's amazing to see David Tuberty like the form he still has at, at the at the age he's like I, I would have thought at this stage he'd be hanging off the boots, but like he's been outstanding for Clare the last few years. Like he's been brilliant and same with Connor Sweeney with Tip. Like like you have to have a marquee or at least one marquee forward and probably two if you're going to do anything. And like Tipperary certainly have it with, with Quinlevin and, and Connor Sweeney and, and Claire have it with David and, and Jim Malone and Keelan Sexton is that kind of X factor. Like he was outstanding in the Clare County final the other day. Like so when he hits it, he's awesome. And some days he's not, but when he, he, he hits it, like everyone knows about it. Like so it should be a shootout. It really should. I know it's in October, but it, it's it should be a shootout going on previous games. Like both teams are well capable of putting up big scores and I certainly wouldn't like to be in the full back line on either team. Anyway. I suppose, Owen, I suppose, uh, Cork and Kerry obviously has your imagination, but if there was another game that probably licked the lips in terms of this Munster Championship, this is probably it. If you're looking on for neutralised and you wanted to take it into a game, probably Clare and Tipperary is probably the, the one you want to go to. Kerry watching on, I suppose... Uh, you mentioned Peter Keane. He will definitely have uh, the videotape out or uh, what, uh, what observing uh, and going through uh, Clare and Tipperary anyway. Yeah, there's no doubt. I suppose Clare and Tip have been consistently, we'll say over the last four or five years, been playing at a higher level than, than the other counties, uh, uh, Waterford and Limerick that we've spoken about. Clare, to be fair, have maintained that consistency, possibly Tip slipping a little bit. But having said that, um, I suppose they, they, they had a blow earlier in the year when a lot of their players weren't going to be there. But the COVID might be a blessing in disguise where them, them players are, 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 are back. And a lot of players will say, got a break. And a lot of players will say, who played a lot of football, a lot of mileage. The break and the COVID break, we found it even with our own club, is it's given a good freshness to fellas. The fellas kind of appreciate, would we'll say, how much the football meant to them and whatnot. So the fellas were, they were, had planned and travelling and stuff, that, 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 that break might, they might come with, with a renewed energy and whatnot. Um, as I said, the tip kind of had been sliding a little bit. Um, having said that, Clare, like Clare, been, the last number of years, the level that they've been playing at has been fantastic, really, for, 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 for Clare football. It's a very, very hard one to call, if I was to call it. I suppose probably just a bit of experience, really, in that Clare side. And Colm Collins, no, no, like he, he, he led the team prepared well. I suppose Owen, uh, the one thing that's been mentioned about this is the league games and the last uh, two league games. Tipperary still have a bit of work to do to avoid relegation. On the flip side with Clare, they have Fermanagh at home. If they, they beat Fermanagh, they're guaranteed safety. And if Armagh lose to Roscommon, Clare have Armagh there in the last day. There's a possibility Clare could actually get promoted if they beat Armagh. Uh, if Armagh lose to uh, Roscommon in the sort of those two league games, I suppose with Tipperary, obviously if they win those two games, they have a bounce. But uh, I suppose as well, Clare have an Armagh the last game in Cusick Park before facing Tipperary. I suppose that's going to be a real competitive ding dong battle. That obviously do good for Clare as well, playing aside uh, Armagh in terms of pre- pre- preparation for Tip. It will, and the other point I suppose is that. Um... Injuries could be a factor too. Um, you have no time to recover. Every team has two league games. Barrows at Waterford have won. But you're going to have two games. You're going to be playing championship the week after. Like So you're going to have no real time to recover. So it's going to be um, 
it's going to be a tight schedule because just every team inevitably picks up knocks in games and players, I suppose, they're prepared as well as they can, but you pick up, would you say, a hamstring strain or anything, you're going to be out the following week. So them two league games, of course, they're going to bring the team on, but there could be negative sides to, to it too, but it just shows how important them two games are going to be. Yeah, and I suppose, uh, Daniel, another not sort of neutral perspective, many battles with, with Tip and Clare, and Tip and Clare have obviously, in the last few years, have closed the gap in terms of Cork. Uh, Clare have beaten Cork a few times. Uh, Tipperary um, have uh, beaten Cork as well. So Cork know all too well know about the rise of uh, Tipperary and Clare in the last few years. Um, look, this time you get to look on in terms of a neutral uh, perspective in this. And Daniel, I suppose you're very familiar in terms of the strengths of uh, uh, Clare and Tipperary. I suppose people are saying a shootout. Do you, do you agree with that term? Yeah, I think it, it could be. Um, well, there's there's no gap between Cork, Tip, and Clare at the moment. Anyway, that gap is gone. Um, there's phenomenal work being put in by both counties over the last number of years. I suppose the the lockdown in a way should suit Tipperary. I think they were on a downward curve. They'd lost a couple of players, having Quinn Levin back. Um, it's a huge boost they take advantage of it and regroup so I think the big thing for Tipperary is how they handle the lockdown and how prepared they're going to be with some panel members back that they, they would have lost in the summer um, I suppose you have to have great admiration for Colin Collins and I'd imagine Clare will still be really well prepared going into that game um, and I suppose I'd still give them the nod in, in Torless just slightly given how, how well they've gone over the last number of years. But uh, it'll, it'll be very interesting to see how Tip regroup and if they, uh, if they kind of can get their mojo back that they had a couple of years ago. Yeah, I suppose, Daniel, one thing when Clare and Tipperary do meet, there will always be uh, goals in, in it. And I suppose goals, you imagine there will be goals in this game as well. And I suppose they can be turning and decisive uh, factors. And we know both teams have uh, goal getters. Clare with like likes of Owen Cleary, uh, Tipperary then, obviously likes of Mike Quinlan to name a few as well. And uh, you imagine there, whoever probably strikes the first goal in this could be very, very crucial. Yeah, as, as Paz said it there, the, the forwards on display are like some of the best in the business. Um, there's all stars in those forward lines. And um, I suppose, again, the, the big thing I focus will be on keep you tight at the back um, for as long as possible. Um, wintry conditions, not having a lot uh, of football played, I suppose it will be very systematic for both teams, you'd imagine. And I suppose whoever can break down the other team's defence more often and get the most joy out of it. Um, we'll have a big chance of that. And you'd have to say if the two lads inside for Tip uh, can get back to their old form, then it's going to be a very interesting game. I suppose, uh, in Shane, in terms of looking at it from a water perspective, if you are victorious against Limerick, I suppose it's a step up again against Clare and Tipperary. But you'd gladly settle for that, uh, pitting your wits against either Clare or Tipperary. And uh, what are your thoughts on this? I suppose you can look back and give a perspective in terms of the fortunes of both sides. We used to talk about Tipperary, probably a team transformed over uh, over the league, but Clare obviously then are very consistent the last few years in, uh, in terms of the championship, uh, knocking on the door for the Super 8s for the last two or three years. Uh, what do you make of this game? Well, it definitely looks like it's the stronger side of the draw. Um, I suppose we kind of mentioned Waterford Limerick and playing each other numerous times. But if you look at those two panels, there's been a huge amount of turnover, especially in Waterford and a good lot in Limerick as well over the last couple of years. Whereas if all those players are back that we're talking about there from both Limerick, or sorry, from Tipperary and Clare, I think it becomes a huge mental battle because they're so used to playing each other at, at a much higher level, all the way up to Division 2, okay, back down to Division 3. But when they play, they have the extra bite, the extra quality, the extra edge. I think that mental battle, they know each other so well so that, you know, you might have, you know, Gordon Kelly might be picking up, say, Connor Sweeney. He probably knows him. He knows his runs inside out. And it just becomes that edge you can bring on the day. And because you haven't had that sustained amount of games um, and preparation, you will have in other years, that mental battle becomes even more, I suppose, acute. So I think it's going to come down to it. Look, the both teams have some savage forwards. But like I think whoever wants it on the day and that mental fortitude to push on, and they're definitely going to fancy their chances against Limerick or Waterford, whatever happens. 
I suppose, uh, Francis, in terms of now the Clare sort of viewpoint as well, uh, Colm Collins, I suppose, uh, in terms of his he, sort of panel and options, uh, Clare, I suppose, uh, a mixed bag in sort of league, I suppose, poor enough uh, sort of start, uh, good sort of finished in uh, in terms of league, probably got themselves back into uh pretty much uh, sort of safety. Bit of work to do, but uh, in terms of the championship uh, Tipperary, we know Clare know Tipperary uh, all too well. Uh, they had to grind out a win l- last year in Torles and it was a real dogfight, but Tipperary, uh, a different animal, I suppose, with the likes of Michael Quinlevin and to, na- to name a few, back, Liam Casey back in the set Yeah, I think uh, Tipperary have always had an attacking style and with uh, Clamell Commercials, they're a really, really good top team. They've just proven over the years, so uh, they have quality players, and uh, I'm sure you know a confident Tipperary team is hard to beat. But I suppose we're all hoping for a, you know, at least a dry evening uh, in all the games that uh, you know the lads can show their quality and and the championship. But uh, you know Tipperary, your know, Torla's been such a great quality pitch. You know if we get a dry night, we should have a, a cracking game of football. But you know both sides have a lot lot to prove, and uh, if they have good league campaigns, you know they can go at it. You know hell for leather because they, I think the league is very is very important. You know for the progression of, you know, likes of Clare being a dual county, you know, you want to keep the young players coming. A lot of them have shown very well in the club championship and, you know, to show them that there is progression to play with the Clare football team and Tipperary likewise. So, you know, if we get a good evening, uh, I think we could have a cracking game and, you know, it's going to be it's going to be a hard one to call. I think I think the league games are going to have a, a, a big bearing, you know, as Owen said there, you know, if they pick up injuries, uh, what's your panel strength like? We all know the marquee players, but do we really know how good the, the players, you know, in the background there? So, you know, it's a, it's it's going to be exciting when it comes around to it. But I think uh, very much the the league um, situation will have a big bearing on on the you know, Emmerich Watford and the Clare Tip uh, side of things. Anyway, you know, the, you don't have the squads. You know, Cork might be down in Division Three, but you know that won't be for long. You know, we saw them there in the Clare in the Clare in the twenties, and they have a lot of quality players and uh, a lot of experience. So. Um, they've left, they're, they're coming back so you know the, the, the boys want to take advantage you know maybe this year if they can but uh, I, I think it's going to be a good a good uh, campaign and I suppose uh, in terms of uh, home advantage do you think it's going to be a, a play a card in this game uh, tip being down with Torles uh, Claire having to travel Claire not in Cusick Park uh, obviously uh, Tipperary I suppose uh, in Torles as well it's probably worth uh, one or two points you imagine yeah, sure. We all know the quality of the pitch there. So, uh, as the lad said, you know, we all look forward to playing on, on the on the big stage and and you know the historic ground. So, I'm sure you know, <coughs> the lads know Torles very well, and uh, they'll go down there and they'll be focused. You know, the teams are so professional now; they don't let the outside world get into them too much for the week of the championship. So, uh, you know, it's on the on the day as they say, and the, the preparation. And uh, I'm sure Colin Collins has done an unreal job in Clare for the last uh, number of years, and uh, you know, can't go without being said that you know what he has achieved. Uh, has been unreal, and uh, I suppose, but Clare are going to this championship without Gary Brennan, you know, first time in a long time. So he, he has been a, a real leader for the lads. So other lads have to step up now in the championship. But as you say, you get Jamie Malone back, and I think a big one now is that Aaron Fitzgerald overcoming his crucial ligament. You know, that, you know, he's a good, strong defender, and uh, you know, if the games are tight, you know, you still have a chance. But uh, I think it, it should be a good um, campaign. I suppose uh, you mentioned there about players back, and I suppose uh, Killian Rowan, the Clare minor captain there as well in uh, 2018, he was supposed to go to Australian rules as well. Uh, that didn't come about, so uh, he's uh, in the fold as well. So that'll be another welcome addition for Colum, I suppose. Yeah, he's a really strong player and he's a good prospect, and we hope that we can keep him rather than going to the Aussie rules because Clare needs every footballer that, that they have, but you know, it's a great opportunity. I wouldn't, I wouldn't deny him that, but you know, Cullum has had a lot of good players uh, come through in the championship. You know, they've shown well the younger lads in the championship. So, uh, as I said, the, the you know the training over the next few weeks and the, the league games are going to be vital. I suppose we'll move on now. We'll move on to the first of the semi-finals, Sunday, November the eighth, uh, Cork versus Kerry. And I suppose at this stage, we'll already probably. Uh, no, the other side of the Munster semi-final draw. One of these teams will have booked their pad into a Munster final. We'll come back to you, uh, Paul. Uh, Cork versus Kerry, I suppose. Uh, the gap has been sort of closing. And Cork, I suppose, uh, in fairness, in the last few years, they have g- given uh, Kerry a bit a more even sort of a contest. And they have done good work on the back of All-Ireland under-21 success. Their minors uh, won the All-Ireland uh, as well last year as well. So... 
Cork football is coming again and it's no, no instance that Brian Hurley back from his uh, cruise ships uh, playing a big uh, role in, and Kieran Sheehan back from Aussie rule. So Brian Hurley, Kieran Sheehan, they'll probably make any team in the country. Yeah, two great players. Um, I know Brian fairly well through work and what he's gone through to come back from a, from a career threatening hamstring injury like where similar to Paul O'Connell's injury that ended his career like and to be taught like look you can't play anymore and he just wouldn't give in um, so like to, to to be that mentally tough to come back and still perform at the highest level is, is huge uh, Cork look I suppose they've had a tricky few years by their own standards where the thing could have went either way maybe, but when you've guys like Canty Graham Canty there getting involved and at the top and trying to sort things out and then they have as you said really good minor under, under 20 teams coming through um you know they're they're back they're back on top again now and um i saw the league game against tip in Turles, um where T- tip played a bit more attacking style that they had in previous games and it was one of the best games i've seen in years where they just went at it but like, tip we scored 315 or 16 or something and lost by a point like cork cork sh- shoot the lights out they were brilliant like um Keane O'Neill there coaching as well who was with the chip hurlers before. So yeah, look, they've like I said, they've had a tricky few years, but they've they've sorted things out and they're um they're closing again like and re- really good young players and and a lot of pace in their team, which is which is difficult to play against like. I suppose in terms of many people uh, in Kerry, I suppose are looking at it now in terms of to seeing uh, the retirements in terms of Dublin and players not being available and saying that probably this is their opportunity this year. Or probably an awful lot of club football played in Kerry in terms of uh, the club championship and then the county championship. So an awful lot of football will be in those Kerry players' legs as well. So if they get over Cork as well, they'll be thinking to themselves, right, Munster final and then we're straight into Ireland semi-final. Uh, they'll probably be thinking that this is probably their year in terms of uh, if they get over Cork to to take down the sort of dubs given the sort of the new management in sort of dubs in Dublin, the transition, few players uh, left the sort of panel. So Kerry are probably sort of, sort of thinking to themselves if we get over the traditional rival uh, uh, Cork, we could be going all the way to Croke Park. Yeah, like... Uh... Obviously, came very close last year, um, and as you said, the uh, the huge advantage in Kerry now leading into this would be the the competitiveness of their club championship and um, county championships down there, where where like every game is a high quality and a high standard. And um, um, I suppose the biggest stroke they pulled in a while was convincing nearly everybody a few years ago that they were in transition. I thought, um, but you know the the talent that's down there. Um, you know, you see Clifford there again last weekend. The goal he scored, like. I mean, the scary thing is he's getting better and better. Like, so you know, the the there's definitely, as you said, the opportunity is there for him now to go and and win the All Ireland. But they're they're cute enough and professional enough. They'll take every game as it comes, and they'll be they'll be just concentrating on Cork for the time being, and um and moving on from there. But definitely huge opportunity there for Kerry this year. And I suppose, uh, Pa, looking at this as well, uh, Cork and Kerry, we all know their battles. But for Cork as well, they're probably looking at it and saying, if this is the time to ambush uh, Kerry, no better chance to ambush Kerry in a semi-final rather than uh, a monster final, maybe to try and catch Kerry on the bit of a bit of bit cold and probably get off to a, a good sort of start. And uh, Cork versus Kerry, I suppose... Form is everything has gone out the window. I suppose league has gone out the window, but all, all, almost uh, it gives us sort of an opportunity there for an ambush as well. If Kerry are are complacent, yeah, and I think not, not that it matters hugely with the quality of the stadium, but I think it's on a Cork as well. Like so, look, they'll they'll want to be. You hit the nail on the head. I think like the the best teams with the with the old structure, you always get a second bite of the cherry. Like if you get if you get caught on a particular day. So like people are only human at the end of the day. Like if as good as Kerry are and like they are class and the likes of David Clifford and Sean O'Shea, and it probably doesn't get into all their heads, but like it's still that that kind of the safety net isn't there. And the Cork lads are so young, the twenties uh, winning the uh, young O'Mahony, you still got Luke Connolly, like the Hurleys are back. Like Paul mentioned earlier about possession from kickouts. Like to be honest, whoever gets 50, whoever gets 55-60% of the ball in this match has a great opportunity because the, the, the forwards on show are just going to be very unstoppable almost. But 
Like you'd have to you'd have to have the back of last year, fancy Kerry. Yeah, I suppose you mentioned Pa fancying uh, Kerry there. I suppose uh, in terms of uh, Kerry, we've seen uh, down through the years, we've seen the likes of uh, Morris Fitzgerald, uh, Colm Cooper, and the baton has been handed now to Clifford, I suppose, uh, in terms of what he's even shown it, in terms of what he's done in terms of the county championship in Kerry. And I suppose that's going to be a key matchup for Cork as well uh, in terms of that. Because uh, obviously, if you can keep... Uh, Dave, I know if there's Kerry of so many quality forwards, but it's half the battle, I suppose, if you can keep Clifford quiet. Yeah, look, and, and as has been shown in the club matches, like there's there's obviously going to be a bit of needle there. Like so when people when, no more than Aaron Gillan and Limerick with the hurling, like the, when when he was kind of being targeted and he reacted, like he, he kinda of had to probably get that out of his game. And like you don't want to take anthems, like you always think Eric Kenton, if he took that out of his game, what, what would he be like to all that bit of age? And, David is such an outstanding footballer. Like he's he is obviously going to be on the receiving end of a lot of stuff, but on and off the ball. Like so and like it only takes one moment of these matches, a moment of brilliance or a moment of madness. Like um and it, it, you'd expect brilliance out of him anyway, like because like the standard he set that goal he got against against Mid Kerry in the in the county final. Like no who would even try that? Like it's just something and he, and he's supposed to, like I don't think you can call it a bad foot, like he's he's less brilliant foot. Um but look it's Cork are going in low. Not that there's no expectations because Cork teams always have that expectation that they, they probably should be winning. But like they're coming in under the radar to a point and everyone's talking about Kerry catching Dublin this year. But like that Munster semi-final is definitely um, an area that, that Kerry wouldn't want to be looking too far past. I suppose, uh, Owen, in terms of all the new rules now, in terms of looking at it from a Kerry viewpoint, in terms of the forward mark, in terms of uh, the black card involving the the, the player being a uh, sim bin now for roughly uh, sort of 10 minutes, I suppose all those things in a Kerry uh, court game are going to have a huge advantage. We all know the powers of Luke Connolly in terms of his fielding, in terms of he's going to obviously be a weapon for Cork in terms of the forward mark. And you've Brian Hurley, a sharpshooter as well. So that's always going to make a, a sort of a different contest. Do you think that all these sort of new rules in terms of if there's black cards in this game, if player to if carry her down to 10 or the carry her down to 14 or Cork are down to 14 and obviously these yeah, just, forward marks as well. Do you think it's going to make it a different and the winter conditions it is going to make it a, a different style of football? Um, well, I think Parky Cree, first of all, is a superb pitch. It's, I suppose it's the equivalent um, of Croke Park, really. Obviously, it's got its um, critics the last number of years, but um, they did a big job in it. I, I was watching the bars in Newstown last night on YouTube, and the pitch is superb. So I don't think the pitch will have a big impact on it. Um, obviously, um, Cork have had success now at minor. Cork have had success at under 20. So they have young players coming. Um, Kerry, I think... There's no doubt they have the forwards. It's um, I knew they were trying to find a couple of midfielders. Dermot O'Connor obviously had a super county championship here in Kerry. Possibly a couple of backs were found. Um, I suppose whoever wins this, whether it's Kerry or Cork, will be fancying themselves to, to 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 win a monster championship. And straight away, you're only you're only an hour away from an Ireland final. Then at thereafter, so it's a big big game. Like it's it's you obviously have the two heavyweights. We'll say on one side of the draw. Um, I've no doubt that that. that Kerry won't be taking Cork for granted whatsoever and uh, it, 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 it's one we're really looking forward to. Yeah, and I suppose in the past, I suppose in, in terms of Cork, uh, they would have been, I suppose, uh, t- playing a sort of possession game, uh, moving by, by the hand, going through sort of the phases, a build-up game. But in the league this year, they've been racking up big scores, uh, racking up 2-12s, 3-14s, uh, sort of high-scoring games. And when forwards get used to uh, kicking up those sort of scores, uh, it becomes, they get into sort of almost a pattern. It becomes the norm uh, sort of thing. So, and, and flip side of that, I suppose, Kerry looking at the, the scores that um, Cork have been putting up uh, in terms of league early on the year, or, or as you mentioned, that probably goes out the window. But uh, I suppose it does show that the Cork forwards are on form going into this game. Yeah, I think the last two league games, I know that the Kerry management will be looking very closely at the, at the Cork two games and, and vice versa. The Cork management will be looking very closely at the Kerry management because that's only when you'll get a feel of what the teams are going to be. There, there, no team has a settled um, a settled 15 really at this stage. 
I haven't a clue what, what Kerry management are thinking as regards their back setups. Even the forwards, I wrote my own club mate, Tony Brosnan, was one of the players in the championship. Obviously, he suffered an injury, but thankfully, it's not overly serious. And he expects to be back in full football in a couple of weeks' time. And he'd be looking at possibly a corner forward berth there. But obviously, there's huge competition then. The likes of Paul Ganey, James O'Donnell, who've been there in the last number of years. Then, obviously, the half forward line, you'll, you'll probably have Tony O'Shea, number 11. And the two wing forwards in, like you've, you've like Stephen O'Brien, Daryl Moynihan, you've Michal Burns, you've all these players. Dermot O'Connor played there last year. They played three big men around the middle. So it's very hard to think what the management is thinking. And that's that's why the, the, the last two league games are going to be, I suppose, extra interesting, really, to see. You, you, you'll see from them games what the, the base of the team are going to, is going to be. I suppose, uh, Daniel, in terms of uh, Cork uh, looking at it, I suppose Cork and Kerry, the midfield battle is, was, uh, is going to be huge. And I suppose for Cork, I suppose, to get a, a stranglehold over David Moore and, uh, in the middle of the park as well, that's going to be a big a big factor, I suppose. He's probably penciled in, I suppose, whether it's Jack Barry or Dermot O'Connor that probably joins him uh, remains to be seen. But uh, Cork will always feel that they could put it up to Kerry in the middle of the park. And I suppose primary possession is going to be key for Cork. Uh, we all know what they have inside, like some Michael Hurley, Brian Hurley, Kieran Sheehan. Uh, they have match winners in the side of the far line, but they have to win their own, kick out and win their own position to get it in there and probably test uh, that Kerry defence. Yeah, well, I think in the, the Munster final last year, that gave uh, Cork's midfield, gave um, Kerry huge trouble. You would Ian McGuire, Killian Hanlon and Rory Dean was out there as well. And Kerry couldn't live with their power running and Cork were probably cutting through the middle an awful lot from midfield. And I suppose they'll have to do the same again um, in this game. Um, it has the makings of being a shootout. Um I think uh, both sets of forwards are probably look stronger than both sets of backs. Um, Cork will have no fear going into their young team. They've won minor and 21, 20 all Ireland's there in the last couple of years. But I suppose the continuity and consistency Kerry have from getting to the all Ireland final last year, and they were going well in the league this year at the in the highest uh, in the highest division, probably will stand to them. And I'd even worry that. Cork will have two games in Division 3 of the National League and Kerry are going to be playing Donegal and Monaghan and are going to be up to speed very quickly um, at championship pace. They're nearly championship games. Those two games is a build-up. I just have a, a small bit of worry for Cork that the, the pace of this game, they're going to have to really be at it because there's no doubt I think Kerry will be. And I suppose, uh, Daniel, in, in terms of this game as well, I suppose uh, the matchups are going to be key. Uh, I suppose who takes who in terms of uh, Cork and Kerry and who marks who. But the danger is you could focus so much on one uh, Kerry forward like Clifford, then it could be James O'Donnell who catches fire. And if James O'Donnell and Clifford are quiet, it could be Paul Geeney that catches fire. Or even Stephen O'Brien has been the torment of Clare for so many years. Um, in, in the half hour line so there's uh, there's match winners everywhere so if you concentrate too much on one guy it's probably the guy that you probably least suspect that, that that hurts you the most and I suppose that's the true point for both sets of uh, forwards on, on show Yeah absolutely I think even, even last year we probably did a, a good enough job on David Clifford considering but you have Sean O'Shea then to look after and, and the rest of the forwards as you said and Similarly, if you look after Luke Connolly on the other side, Michael Hurley could do record in a given day. And there, there's Mark on both sides. Um, I suppose it's whoever's system kind of defensively is the unit and who, who can kind of, I suppose, protect each other within how to defend is the big thing. I think um, one, if, you, if you leave it 15 on 15 here, it's just, uh, it'll be very hard to beat Kerry Cork. We're going to have to come up with some kind of defensive shape that can safeguard them and still allow them to attack at the same time. Um, I suppose Dublin and Kerry and Cork, it's gone back to the way now where like, you have to defend as a group, but you have to attack as a group as well and leaving men behind the ball won't work either. So it's, it's going to be very interesting for Cork, especially given, I suppose, they had great success in the league, kind of playing attacking football. Um, but I suppose... The COVID break probably came at the wrong time for them, so it'll be very interesting to see how, uh, how they adapt now over the next couple of weeks and have their game plan in place for Kerry. And I suppose uh, Shane, looking on from it from a water perspective, Waterford perspective now, uh, Cork uh, versus Kerry. I suppose always a, a traditional uh, powerhouse battle, and uh, 
so many factors in play but the, I suppose the, the tactical battle on the line as well uh, Peter uh, Keane versus Ronan McCarthy and there's no doubt that Ronan McCarthy probably came in for criticism in his first start of year but he's adapted sort of well he's sort of uh, grown into the Cork uh, sort of footballing job and he see, they seem to have turned turned the corner but I suppose Cork playing Kerry at home uh, they'll have to be I suppose uh, at half time really a point uh, up or a level or a point down because the last thing you want to do is go chasing a Kerry side yeah, kind of. I was kind of laughing to myself there. People are talking about uh, Cork having a lot of good young footballers having a like, good success when Kerry had won, you know, five of the previous minor All Irelands. So, like, I mean, both of them have an embarrassment of riches. I think I agree with Daniel there that the last two Lash League games are vital. Cork are not a Division Three team, but they're going to be playing Division Three sides. That's a huge gulf too the tactical acumen you're going to find in, say, Division 1 against the top teams. Uh, on the other side of it then, I, I would think that when I look at both teams, I see it's the only game I can see Cork beating Kerry in is in that first one-off. Run, or Because I think there's a lot more progression to be made in Kerry. But I think that Kerry need Cork to be strong because Kerry need an edge when they go into Munster if they want to put it up to the dubs in, hopefully, for them, you know three or four or five weeks time and if they're serious right about competing with the dubs they need car to be strong to push them that extra mile For, from a tactical point of view i just can't see cork you know go out and play the attacking style if they'll be allowed to play in division three because kerry that's what kerry will want kerry will beat any team in the country when it comes to 15 on 15 and the attack and style of play so they're definitely going to have to come up with some plan to get the ball in quick to their own forwards they're, they're, Cork have always been excellent at pacey men coming off the shoulder support play but if you leave yourself if you turn over ball if you leave yourself exposed at the back you're going to get crucified against Kerry I suppose uh, Francis if I can bring it on to you now uh, Cork versus Kerry I suppose uh, two, we, we all know too well to Kerry we've seen him so many times in the Munster semi-finals uh, in the last few years coming up against them but Cork and Kerry it takes on its sort of own edge its own sort of battle and what are your thoughts on it? I'm sure growing up that was the big game you know Cork and Kerry in Munster final and uh, they had many a battle to and fro over the years so uh, it's going to be no different but the way Owen you described all their forwards there it's just, you know frightening to listen to all the, the list of names there and what their potential and what they can do and what they have done so it's going to be a uh, a real battle for Cork, and as Led said, you know, Cork are going to have to try and stay in the game as long as they can and maybe catch them at the end when they get a bit nervous for the Kerry Les because the weight of expectation is probably greater in Kerry than any other county in the, in the country. So maybe that, that's what Cork might be hoping for that they can stay with them and, uh, you know, make it a bit nervy. But, you know, I, I think it's going to be a, a good game, and uh, we're all hoping for a good game. But, you know, it's very hard to see past Kerry, and, uh, you know, but this year it's, it's, a, it's back to traditional championship of knockout stuff. So, it's going to be different and as well as that the lead in time is going to be different you know we're all talking there about the league game's been vital so um you know i'm sure i'm sure that they're going to have to get get their um guidance from those games and how who's on form and who's not in form but Kerry seems to have an array of talents you know even their backs are the are top scorers so uh you know it's going to be it's going to be a good one but i think uh, Kerry Kerry for me anyway I suppose, lads, uh, we're sort of pushed on time now. So for the last 30 seconds, I'm just going to come around the table. I'm just going to call to you who you think will be in the Munster final and uh, who do you think are going to emerge victorious. Uh, so first of all, Paul Fitzgerald, who do you think uh, is going to be, what's going to be the Munster final this year and uh, who do you think will emerge on top? I think if, if uh, I think Kerry will be in the final and I think if Tip uh, get all their players fit and stay injury free, uh, I think we have a right chance of getting there. Uh, I suppose I'll come to you, so pa, pa Ranahan. Uh, same question: Who do you think will be in the Munster final, and who do you think will uh, emerge victorious? Uh, I think same as Paul with Kerry. Um, I'd like to say Limerick, but my head probably goes with Clare. So, but um, and I think Kerry will not. Uh, I'll come to you now. I suppose uh, Owen Brosnan. Uh, who do you think will be in the Munster final, and who do you think will emerge victorious? Um, I think it'll be Kerry, and I think it'll be clear. But the we'll say the, the 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 earlier side of the draw that we 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 addressed very very open. But I think Clare probably would be the favourites there. I think Kerry then would be 
looking if they get to a final, looking at an All Ireland semi final berth with, with bigger expectations. That's that'd be my prediction. Uh, I suppose I'll come to you, uh, Daniel. Uh, uh, Monster final uh, 2020. Who will be there and who will emerge victorious? Yeah, I'd go. I'd go Kerry and Claire as well. Um, I think they're the most experienced squads, and they'll have the least preparation to do in terms of their tactics and what they're about. Um, if 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 they have all their players fit, um, and I think Cork will give Kerry a scare, and that'll only suit them for the Monster final. So I'll go Kerry for the Monster final. Uh, I suppose I'll come to you now, uh, uh, Shane Briggs. Uh, who do you think will be in the Munster final uh, this year and who will emerge victorious? Uh, Kerry, Kerry on the, that side of the draw. I think Claire, if Gary Brennan is not playing, I give Tip the edge. I think Tip might just shade him and Kerry to come out victorious. I suppose, uh, lastly, Francis uh, McInerney, what will be the Munster final this year and who will emerge victorious? Well, I have a great respect for Tipperary, but you know we all want our own crowd to do well. So you know, I tip Clare to just about get there to the final, and you know more than likely meet Kerry. Sure, and we like an upset in Clare now. So, uh, but I suppose Kerry are, are the unfair favourites for the whole lot. Uh, I suppose. Uh, lastly, I would like to thank our guests. Uh, that concludes our special our RCB Radio Sport West Clare spe- special Munster Football Championship preview show. This show will be available uh, on Monday night. It will go live on ninety two point five and ninety four point eight. FM and online at www.rcb and it will also stream out on our YouTube channel RCB Sport I would like to thank our panel again Paul Fitzgerald from Tipperary Pat Ranahan from Limerick Daniel Goulding from Cork Owen Brosnan from Kerry Shane Briggs from Waterford and Francis McInerney uh, from Clare and I would just like to say thanks uh, for watching all this evening Uh, we hope for a prosperous uh, Munster Football Championship and whoever emerges victorious in Munster please God uh, they'll go on and claim the All Ireland in 2020. Thanks, lads. Yes. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Take care. Hello. Hello, guys. Hello, guys.